Hello, I'm Lisa Martin from Hariba Veterinary and I'm delighted to welcome you to our Continuing Professional Development webinar. We'll be shortly hearing from Ian Wright, veterinary surgeon and owner of the Mount Veterinary Practice in Fleetwood, Lancashire. Ian qualified from Glasgow University and has a master's degree in veterinary parasitology. He's head of SCAP, the European Scientific Council for Companion Animal Parasites, UK and Ireland, Guideline Director for SCAP Europe and Editorial Board Member for Companion Animal and Vet CPD Journal. Although you may not have heard of us before, Hariba Veterinary provide a wide range of in-house laboratory diagnostic equipment, from small animal to equine and farm work. Hariba Veterinary have a comprehensive range from handheld meters measuring single parameters to benchtop systems capable of running over 400 tests per hour. Our LACWA range can accurately measure ionised calcium in blood in seconds and can be used patient side. This incredibly useful tool aids in the detection of subclinical hypercalcemia in dairy cattle which can affect yield, post calving recovery and even future fertility. We also offer a wet clinical chemistry system with onboard refrigeration which covers a wide range of parameters for day-to-day -day testing and beyond, including electrolytes, metabolic indicators and inflammatory markers, including acute phase proteins. Our webinar today is linked to our Pocket Central PCR Analyzer. This is a bench chop instrument which even the smallest veterinary laboratory can accommodate. Its automated process allows you to save time on PCR testing with no need to wait for a lab pickup or for results to come back. If you have any questions about our webinar today, for Ian or for the Hariba team, we'll be having a Q&A session after the webinar has finished. Please put your questions into the chat and we will answer as many of your queries as possible. You will also have our contact details if you'd like to get in touch with Ian or the Hariba team after the event. So now I'd like to hand over to Ian who's going to talk to us about exotic parasites and the importance of testing in imported dogs. Thank you very much for that introduction um, and thank you all for coming and listening to this. Um, I think this is a, a sort of topic that is very, very close to, to all of our hearts. We're certainly all seeing a lot of imported pets um, rescued from, from all sorts of locations um, internationally and sort of, you know, sort of all parts of the world. Um, with all sorts of different exotic parasites. But what I'm going to be focusing on tonight is very much the importance of testing these pets. Without testing, we're blind, really, as to what they're carrying. It's absolutely essential to know, um, you know, sort of what sort of parasites, what sort of pathogens they might have. Um, I should just say um, from that introduction, if anybody's got any questions, we would love to have questions and to have a discussion at the end. If you could put them in the control panel uh, question section and not in the chat, that would be lovely. And um, we'll pick them up then. So when we're talking about testing um, in the imported pet, the parasites that they might be carrying, um, it's really... Um, to prevent um, sort of novel parasites establishing in the UK. So what we don't want is for exotic parasites with zoonotic potential, potential pathogens of cats, dogs, um, even livestock, um, to become widespread um, and start internal transmission within the UK. Um, but that in itself is a difficult sell. Um, it's very, very difficult, um, you know, to sort of sell that to clients and say, well, for the greater good, we'd quite like you to spend large sums of money. Um, clients, you know, will have got these pets. They'll be very excited. Um, often they'll have rescued them from difficult circumstances. They'll be looking forward to having a new pet. And it can be very difficult, whether it's based on clinical signs or whether it's screening, to then be able to say to them, well, you know, you are going to have to spend some money or we'd advise you spending some money on diagnostic tests. So 
in terms of the client spending the money, it's important to emphasise that we're doing this as well to protect them, to protect individuals and the wider public from zoonotic risk. Um, so there's a public health aspect to this, but it's also essential for health planning for the individual patients. So a lot of these pathogens are going to emerge with clinical signs sort of months or years after initial infection. So knowing that they're present, deciding whether we're going to treat them now, whether we're going to monitor the patient um, and maybe treat them later on in life, you know, is extremely important for the planning for that individual patient's health. So which parasites are we worried about? Well, there is wondrous variety. I mean, I am amazed uh, by the new pa parasites that keep turning up, but there are major players that we need to consider. And these are really the ones that we want to test for. So tick-borne pathogens, hugely important. Um, Leishmania and phantom, I think we're seeing more and more of in practice uh, in imported pets, um, but also um, flyborne nematodes. So easily the most important of these uh, is um, heartworm, so Dirofilaria rheumatis, um, but we've also got um, subcutaneous worms, um, things like Dirofilaria repens, um, Dipetalanema, um, and eye worms as well, like Falazia calipeda. So all sorts of worms that can be transmitted by flies. Um, and a relatively sort of curveball sort of new player that we're concerned about is Brucella, Brucella canis. Now, I have to say this is a little bit on the edge of, of my expertise, um, but it's something that I want to talk about briefly because it is an important zoonosis and it's one that's appearing now in imported dogs. So the thing is, you know, you're a vet in practice, first opinion practitioner, and the likelihood is that on a fairly regular basis now, I would say you're going to have imported cats and dogs land um, on your consulting room table. And sometimes that importation history is going to be obvious, sometimes it isn't. So it's very important that certain information is collected on initial contact. Um, it's very important to nail down that history of importation. So where did it come from and when did it come from that country? Sometimes the history of importation will be lost altogether. So we'll have situations where, you know, dogs and cats may have changed hands. You know, they may have initially been imported. Then there have been behavioral problems. They may have been sent back to national rescue organizations. Um, or, you know, they may have changed hands several times and it's very easy when that happens for the importation history to be lost. So if it's a rescue dog, it's important to dig back and just find out where it might have come from. Um, the means of importation is important. Was it individually arranged or is a charity involved? So if charities are arranging importation of these pets, it's important to know um, sort of, you know, whether any testing has been done, whether they've had any previous testing. If you can get a clinical history, that is invaluable. Um, a lot of the clinical signs for parasites are intermittent or they're chronic. So, you know, just knowing whether they've had, say, um, anemia in the past, um, thrombocytopenia, uh, whether they've had lymphadenopathies, skin issues, hugely important and also you know whether they've had any recent preventative treatments so they should have had their compulsory tapeworm treatment on arrival um, but also you know have they had any flea treatment tick treatment have they been on heartworm preventatives it's always worth asking the new owner will be very excited might just neglect to tell you how well their new cat or dog has been since they've been with them. And if they've noticed any clinical signs, that is hugely useful, um, hugely important. So NSCAP UK and Ireland, we give um, free parasite advice. We're a, a sort of parasite advice group, and we've developed what we call the four pillars for dealing uh, with imported cat 
cats and dogs. So just to go over these quickly, because testing sort of fits into this, um, it's important to check for ticks um, when they arrive, and I'll talk about that briefly and what that might involve. Um, it's very important once you've found ticks to get them identified for reasons that I'll describe. Um, you need to treat with praziquantel. I mean, hopefully they'll have had the compulsory treatment already, but there is still this five day window in which they may be infected with Echinococcus multilocularis, which is a dangerous zoonosis. So treating them again within 30 days of arrival is very, very important. Um, it's extremely important to give them a clinical examination and that clinical examination is likely going to guide what clinical tests we might want to perform. But it is also very, very important to screen for certain pathogens. So leishmania, heartworm, um, exotic tick-borne pathogens. And now I, I would add to that risk, although it's not technically a parasite, I would ask, uh, add uh, brucella as well. So testing on the basis of clinical exam. Um, now this is something um, that you know is very, very important. So there'll be certain clinical signs that you'll then be able to say to the client, well, look, you know, from the country that this cat or dog has come from, um, these clinical signs indicate that they might have these pathogens. So the sort of signs that you want to be looking for are lymphadenopathy. Um, this will occur in a lot of exotic parasites uh, coming into the country. Um, cardiovascular um, and ocular signs can give you a lot of information. Um, and a lot of these parasites will affect the skin as well, either directly or through systemic illness. Um, I think one of the sort of key things to remember is that these signs can be dramatic. So I think if we look at the uh, dog at the top, you probably have an inkling that something's wrong there. Uh, it's got leishmaniosis, and you subsequently go on your tests, and you know you get that diagnosis nailed. Um, but the dog in the bottom of the picture also has leishmania, and it's only presenting signs um, where this sort of vague. Um, sort of mild alopecia. Um, so you know, it's very important, even if the signs aren't dramatic, to pick up on them and think, well, what parasites might be causing these clinical signs? And I'm going to keep coming back to this, but it's important to remember uh, that these clinical signs can occur months or years after importation. So an initial clinical exam when they first arrive in the country is hugely useful. Um, but we need to continue to keep that importation and travel history in mind if clinical signs develop much later. So I'm just going to run through uh, a few of the parasites that we, current, uh, that we commonly see uh, in imported dogs um, and some of the clinical signs that might be associated with them. Um, and the diagnostic tests that are available. So if we start off with heartworm, um, this is really is now becoming quite common in imported dogs. At SCAP, we get a lot of queries about heartworm. Really, it and leishmania are topping the table in terms of the parasites that we'll get asked about uh, on a weekly basis. Um, a heartworms uh, mosquito transmitted, um, very clinically significant in dogs that become infected. We need to remember that cats and ferrets can be infected as well. Um, the mosquito vector capable of transmitting heartworm is present right across Europe, and that includes the UK, um, but it's temperature limiting. So it can only reproduce, can only complete its life cycle in the mosquito if certain temperatures are reached for long enough. And so far, it's just not warm enough in the UK for it to complete its life cycle. So when we're looking for it in imported dogs, it is more for their health, um, for long-term planning for their health, than us being worried about it establishing, becoming, a zoo, um, becoming an endemic parasite here. Um, it does have zoonotic potential, but it's, it's very mild um, and it's due to being exposed to infected mosquitoes. So it's not 
and it's not a worry for owners or owners of infected pets. It's not a worry about trans zoonotic transmission in the UK at the moment. Um, you know, it really is the health of the individual pet um, and treating it appropriately. And the clinical signs that we're really looking for with heartworm are cardiopulmonary disease. So cough, exercise intolerance, um, sort of failure to thrive, um, generally all linked in to the respiratory um, and cardio system. Don't trust imported histories unless you've actually got your hands on any original test results. So I've seen dogs that have arrived with positive tests and negative tests that with subsequent investigation have turned out not uh, to be accurate. So, you know, you need to bear in mind that these tests might have been done in good faith, um, but the sensitivity and specificity of different tests vary. Um, they might have done antibody testing, which is only evidence of exposure. Um, you know, so it's very, very important to know which test has been done and when it was done. This just to give you a feel of where heartworm can be found at the moment. So the hash lines are Dirofilaria repens, which is its less pathogenic cousin. I'll come back to it briefly later. Uh, it lives in the skin, um, but you know, similarly, it's transmitted by mosquitoes. It doesn't require these warm temperatures to be transmitted, which is why you can see its distribution in Europe is much wider spread. And so far, that need for warm temperatures has kept heartworm in the south and east of Europe, but it is spreading. So there would have been a sort of dividing line across Europe that you could have drawn, and really heartworm would have been south of that. But in recent years, it spread northwards into Romania, Bulgaria, right throughout Eastern Europe. And of course, it was already endemic in the Mediterranean. So this is where a lot of imported dogs come from. Um, but it also demonstrates that it is gradually moving north. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility that, you know, give it another 10, 15 years that foci could be establishing in the UK as well. Not just a European problem, if there are dogs being imported from Asia or North America, South America, then they get it as well. And it's not just the relocation of dogs, it isn't just a European issue. So in North America, heartworm has been transported out of its traditional heartlands and gone to places where the mosquito can't support transmission um, because of the relocation of rescue dogs from disasters, largely like Hurricane Katrina. Um, so, you know, we have to bear in mind that, you know, in America, in Europe, um, you know, dogs with parasites that aren't traditionally endemic may still present in your surgery. So it is very, very important to confirm an existing diagnosis. Um, treating dogs with adulticides is involved. It takes a long time. Essentially, whatever method you're going to try to eliminate um, heartworms from the body with, it's a prolonged, involved effort. And, you know, as a result, you want to be certain of that diagnosis before you start. So, you know, you want to bore into which tests have been performed and whether they're reliable. Need to remember that false negatives are possible as well. So if the clinical signs fit, it is worth still pursuing um, screening tests, diagnostic tests, um, you know, just to see whether heartworm is present or not. Um, certainly screening is very, very important. It can be a long time before clinical signs develop and you don't want dogs sitting uh, with heartworms in their pulmonary arteries and heart chambers. It's going to be much better to treat early and eliminate them if they're present. Um, so, you know, we don't take all of these things into consideration before we start treatment. So how do we go about diagnosis? Well, we've got a few options uh, for treating heartworm or diagnosing heartworm, sorry. Um, you can do a direct smear. I would say for almost every parasite I'm going to describe, it's worth doing a direct smear. 
Um, the sensitivity for most of them is going to be very, very low. You might just get lucky. You might see a microfilaria, you know, um, an immature worm on that slide on a normal blood smear. The odds are, though, that you're not. So a negative smear tells you nothing. If you're going to look for these little worms in the bloodstream, then you really need a concentration method. And there's a couple of different ones. There's the knots test, or the modified knots test, where essentially you use formalin um, to sort of break down all the blood cells. You centrifuge the blood, and then look at the sediment under a microscope and see if any of these worms are present. Um, and they'll be dead at that point, which makes means they'll be nice and still. Um, you can stain them up, and you can attempt to identify. Um, it's a really useful test. I mean, I advise doing this alongside, um, say, antigen testing uh, for heartworm. Um, it's a good backup test, but it also identifies other uh, filarial worms that the dogs or cats might have. So dirofilaria repens, um, dipethylanema will also have microfilaria in the bloodstream and can be identified by this method. Um, and it's actually pretty sensitive if you've got a decent female worm bird uh, producing these larvae. You can do just a simple micro um, and then look in the buffy coat uh, for worms. Um, and this is shown in the image here. Um, it'd be really, really lovely to see them. You can't identify them by this method, but it will tell you that some sort of filarial nematode um, is present. So it's a really sort of simple initial test that you can do. If you do do a modified net, uh, knots and stain, or if you get lucky with a direct smear, this is what you're going to see. So you're going to see this sort of sheafed uh, filarial nematode. Um, if you've got the skills, you've got a trained, experienced eye, you can then identify these. It, it's tricky. Um, I mean, if anybody's interested, if they email me, I can provide them with a little table, um, you know, to try and sort of tell the difference. Sometimes, you know, even I struggle. Um, experienced people struggle sometimes. So I think, you know, you are probably better if you need to identify the larvae to send them to an external lab. And a lot of these now um, do combination packages with other testing. Um, they'll do a knots test for you. Radiography is really useful in suspected heartworm patients. Um, it's not going to give you a diagnosis of heartworm, but it's extremely important to know how advanced any associated heart disease is, because um, it's going to affect prognosis and it's going to um, signify what sort of supportive treatment in terms of heart medication you're going to need to give. Um, and what you're really looking for is changes in the pulmonary arteries. So they're going to get bigger, torturous. Um, they're going to be struggling under the heartworm burden. Um, and they're most pronounced and first seen across the caudal lung fields. So that's where, where you're going to be looking. You can also get, with migrating larvae, a pulmonary parenchymal disease. And you may see this in cats as well. Um, and in severe cases, you're going to start to get heart changes with right sided heart enlargement. So it's really to assess the patient, see how advanced the case is, rather than diagnosing heartworm specifically. What is really useful is ultrasound. And you, you do need someone experienced, but I'm finding with, with queries that we're getting that more and more ultrasonographers are getting their eye in with heartworm and doing quite well. So it's certainly well worth having, having a go. And it is very sensitive and specific test in the right hands. So um, what you need to do is track uh, the pulmonary arteries down to their bifurcation to make sure that you don't miss a worm. Uh, what you're looking for is, if you follow that arrow in the image, you're looking for the walls of the worm, um, which, you know, just show up um, on the echo uh, as a sort of parallel lines. Uh, now, I mean, 
like you'd imagine they can be quite easy to miss you have to have your eye in it does take quite a thorough examination um but the real real beauty of doing this is that it's going to tell you how many worms are there and that is going to indicate what potential complications you might have as they die um the risk of any pulmonary thromboembolism with treatment um as well as being heavily tied into exercise is tied into the number of worms that you've got so just really really useful test if you've got someone who's experienced enough well most of us are going to rely on antigen serology and um, i mean this is the sort of you know real go-to test for heartworm uh, certainly the gold standard test in dogs um, it's got a high sensitivity it's highly specific what it's detecting is antigen produced um, neuterine secretions from the female worm so it doesn't need a female worm to be present so that is going to limit its sensitivity in very low burdens which cats tend to have um, so it is much less sensitive a test in cats but in dogs you've got positive dogs you've normally got enough worms there that there's at least one female present I mean, in which case, you know, it is an extremely sensitive test. Um, you can heat treat the serum, which they sometimes do um, in the States to increase sensitivity, but it decreases specificity. And a lot of us will be using this as a screen or we want to be certain that we've got a positive case before we start adulticide treatment. So I'd have I would advise against heat treating at the moment in the UK as it's not an endemic parasite. Um, you know, I think as a sort of standard test, particularly backed up by the knots, um, this is this test is, is sensitive enough. One of the, the sort of questions we get um, a lot is whether we should treat heartworm positive dogs. Uh, and when I say that, um, I mean in terms of the fact that there is some risk in treating them. Um, every heartworm positive dog you treat runs the risk of thromboembolism and death potentially as a result of treatment. So not to be undertaken lightly, Having said that, though, there is a risk of thromboembolism and long term heart disease if we don't treat at all. So I would say on balance, in most cases, treatment is the best option. And I, I would treat most cases. We do need to take prognosis into account, though, and that's going to depend on the level of um, rest that can be given to the dog so it's very very important to have owners on board from the start and understand they're going to have to strictly rest this dog uh, for months possibly many months so you know it's important before we start treating dogs that you know they understand the level of commitment that's going to be required if infected dogs exercise, the risk of thromboembolism starts to climb significantly. So that rest is extremely important. Um, but prognosis is also linked directly into the number of worms, which is where um, knots tests for microfilaria and ultrasound really come into their own. Um, but also the degree of existing pulmonary vascular disease. And this is where the x-rays are so important to help assess the likelihood of a good outcome of treatment. As I've said before, but I mean, it's important to emphasize again, it's really important to know that your dog's definitely positive uh, before you start treatment. Um, you, know, you absolutely don't want to be going under this long journey of treatment regimes um, and sort of using adulticides unless you've got a definite positive dog. Um, it is worth asking the question as well how big the infestation is um, and how cool the infestation is. So if you've got very low burdens, say if you've got one or two worms that have been present for years and you've got no clinical signs, the question has to be asked whether you're going to risk rocking the boat um, through treating. And, you know, those those are one of the few circumstances you know, where you haven't got a poor prognosis where I might think, well, you know, are we going to initiate treatment? Um, 
But the other one is whether you've got co-infection. So, I mean, if you've got a dog, say, that's also positive for Ehrlichia, that, say, has got chronic Ehrlichiosis, or is struggling uh, with leash mania, then, you know, these may well take priority or affect the prognosis, you know, to the point where, you know, you're not necessarily going to want to treat the heartworm. So these are the sorts of things that you want to take into account. But you can see that the testing is going to help you make that decision, as well as knowing whether the dog's positive in the first place. Moving on to tick-borne pathogens, there are a lot of tick-borne pathogens that are coming in in imported dogs, um, a sort of staggering array of them, if you like. To briefly summarise, most of the ones that you're going to see in imported dogs are transmitted by Rhyphocephalus sanguineus, which isn't endemic in the UK. So again, we're not testing for them necessarily because of the risk of them establishing in the UK, but again, as a long term sort of prognostic indicator and sort of treatment plan for the patient um, or monitoring plan. Um, so Alicia canis is being seen very frequently now, but we are also seeing um, cases of Hepatozoan, um, of Anaplasma platys, which causes cyclic uh, thrombocytopenia. Uh, the zoonotic uh, Rickettsia canorii, Mediterranean spotted fever, um, and also Babesia bigelli, which is sort of less pathogenic uh, cousin of Babesia canis. Um, we are seeing Babesia canis, though, imported, um, which is transmitted by Dermacenter, which we do have small pockets of in the UK. Uh, there was an outbreak in Dermacenter ticks in Harlow uh, a few years ago. So, there is the potential for local focal um, endemic establishment uh, for Babesia canis, but again, mostly it, it's the health of the patient that we're concerned about. Um, Ixodes species, of course, are present all over the UK uh, and can transmit Lyme, which is already endemic here, um, but they can also transmit tick-borne encephalitis virus, which has just started to establish small foci in the UK, um, zoonotic, uh, you know, nasty, um, nasty virus. Um, so again, one that we just want to be aware of may be coming in in infected dogs or infected ticks on dogs. So what sort of signs, what sort of clinical signs are we looking for in, when, in dogs and cats that are coming in with exotic tick-borne infections? Well, far and away, the most common ones are raised lymph nodes and pyrexia. And essentially, if you've got any cat and dog that's got a travel history and it's got raised lymph nodes and pyrexia, tick-borne pathogens really want to be at the top of your list as a possibility. And any any of the tick-borne pathogens I've just mentioned might present in that way, particularly if infection is recent. A lot of them present with anemia, um, especially immune-mediated hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia. And the main ones that you're sort of worried about there are Babesia canis, uh, which classically presents acutely, uh, but can present chronically as well, either with anemia or thrombocytopenia. Uh, Alicia canis uh, can present with either, but tends to be more thrombocytopenia, especially in chronic cases. Um, and Anaplasma platys causes this particular cyclic thrombocytopenia. So you may have an existing, existing history of thrombocytopenia that's been treated and it's come and gone. Um, you know, it's just not, just not shifting over time. If you've got that sort of history, then anaplasma platys really wants to be top of, of your differential. Again, should be borne in mind that Ehrlichia canis can present chronically months or years after infection. And if it does, it actually carries quite a poor prognosis. Um, you can still attempt treatment, um, but the owner would need to really be on board uh, and understand that the outcome might not be good. Um, outcomes tend to be much better treating acute ehrlichiosis uh, than chronic ehrlichiosis. So we just, we just have to bear that in mind. 
Um, you can also get neurological signs largely associated with alichia canis. So acutely or chronically, you can get um, loss of balance, seizures, uh, weakness, um, cranial nerve deficits, um, you know, all sorts of different presentations. Um, but also, you know, although it's not common in dogs, tick-borne encephalitis virus will present in a similar way. So, you know, we just, just need to bear that in mind. So how do we diagnose them? Well, a blood smear. If you've got any of those clinical signs, straight away, I would do a blood smear. Um, the sensitivity is going to be low, so it's going to be about 4% for Alicia canis, um, probably a little bit lower uh, for some of the others. Um, the only exception to that is hepatozoin, where you can get large numbers of gametocytes in the bottom left uh, of the picture here. Um, very distinctive um, and yet reasonably likely to pick them up on a blood smear, especially if you've got a clinically affected dog. If we move from left to right, the next one along is Anaplasma platys, um, which has morally in platelets, and they've got this classic double dot look. So if you do pick them up, I promise you won't miss them. They're very, very distinctive. And the next one along um, is Alicia canis morally. And again, you know, they have this very, very distinctive appearance. So well worth looking, but it's really the hepatozoan that you're most likely to pick up. Um, in clinical cases, you are going to find Babesia canis. So if you've got an acutely presenting immune-mediated hemolytic anemia or thrombocytopenia associated with Babesia canis, then you will see pyroplasms in red blood cells, particularly if you take peripheral um, blood samples, so ear pricks, um, you know, sort of, or, you know, sort of toes, you're going to get um, these sort of classic parasite presentations. So they're lovely. They sort of come in little paired arrangements often, but not always. Sometimes just a single pair, but not always. But always this lovely pear-shaped appearance coming off from each other at a slight angle. So again, promise, not going to miss them. Serology is, is useful, um, particularly for alichia and anaplasma. Not so much for Babesia, uh, because you get a lot of cross-reaction with other apicomplexan parasites like Toxoplasma, uh, Neospora. Um, but um, we just have to remember, if we're using it for the others, that there could be exposure, previous exposure that you're picking up and not current infection. Uh, a useful way to distinguish with Alicia is to do quantitative serology. A couple of weeks apart, if you get a rough doubling of um, sort of antibody levels in that time period, you can be pretty confident you've got active infection, an active infection that's going to lead to clinical signs, which if you're in a chronic situation is, is bad news. Um, I mean, if you get positive serology for anaplasma or alicia and the dog's been in the country for months after, um, you know, sort of uh, after importation, you'd be pretty confident um, that it's not previous exposure. I mean, to be fair, anaplasma phagocida phylum is endemic in the UK, so, you know, maybe previous exposure to that. But with the combined travel history, you'd be pretty suspicious. We can also uh, run PCR, which is extremely useful, um, highly sensitive and specific. Um, it's going to pick up about five in six alicia cases from blood, extremely sensitive uh, for Babesia, and in some cases will allow sp a speciation as well, which is useful, um, but also highly sensitive and specific for anaplasma and hepatozoan as well. So, you know, often running PCR packages for these tick-borne pathogens is very, very useful. Now, leishmania is a big one. And I think even 15 years ago, if you'd have said to me, oh, you know, you're going to be seeing leishmania cases on a regular basis in the UK, 
uh, I would have been slightly skeptical, but they are incredibly common now. Here um, in Germany as well, we're seeing lots and lots of positive cases imported. Sometimes accidentally, um, sometimes people will rescue pets from endemic countries and not realize that they're positive. Um, but often now, deliberately as well, you know, they'll rescue them, uh, often keep them together with other positive dogs and cats as part of leash clubs. Um, it's a growing trend, however you might feel about it, it is definitely a growing trend. Um, the parasite, because it's largely lim limited by its sandfly vector, is still pretty much where it was before. So in southern Eastern Europe, we just have to bear in mind that it can move up and down seasonally through Eastern Europe. So seasonally present, for instance, in Romania um, and also in France. So seasonally present in central France. So we just have to bear that in mind when we're considering where our imported cat or dog might have come from. Um, it could, it could be transmitted in the UK. A, a lot of people uh, rescue these dogs and bring them in, believing it's not a serious disease uh, or serious pathogen, which is a mistake. Um, you know, I mean, this is a serious pathogen in cats and dogs, um, and is going to be life limiting in many cases. Um, but also they'll say, well, we haven't got these sand flies. We don't need to worry about its transmission in the UK. But there are parts of the world where it's maintained through other routes. And the most common route is venereal and congenital transmission. So, you know, it can be transmitted from one generation to the next, um, but also um, venereally from male to female dogs. So. That's a, that's a major route in, in non-endemic countries. It could also be transmitted through blood transfusion. Uh, and because of cost, there isn't any routine screening for this, before, for this before blood transfusion in the UK. So that just needs to be borne in mind. Um, and there is some evidence of transmission by dog bites as well. So, you know, if you have lots of dogs in an endemic country, then there may be some limited uh, transmission risk through that way as well. Um, there have been a couple of cases in the UK where transmissions occurred and we, we just don't know how. There hasn't been an obvious route. And there have been various routes suggested in countries where this has occurred, in Germany, UK, North America, that possibly mechanical transmission may be occurring through other biting flies and that it may be close contact with other infected dogs. We're not sure, but I think on this basis, you could, you, know, you could agree that it's probably not ideal for large numbers of positive dogs um, to be running around together. So when we have imported dogs, um, what sort of clinical signs are we looking for? And cats as well. We must remember that it can be present in cats as well. So it can be cutaneous or visceral or you know, a little bit of both. Um, very commonly, you'll get alopecia. So you'll get the hair loss that I showed earlier. Um, classically, you'll get lunettes. You'll get a loss of hair around the eyes it can be quite easily mistaken for atopy uh, and um, sort of dogs be put on immune suppressive anti-itch drugs um, and you know often under those circumstances leech mania will get worse so we just have to bear that in mind um, you will in a lot of cases get associated um, hyperkeratosis you'll get ulceration on the skin um, but you'll also get more systemic um, immune mediated signs. So uncommonly you can get polyarthritis in individual or multiple joints. Uh, more commonly you'll get inclusion bodies. So you'll get uveitis, you get um, sort of visible bodies inside the chambers of the eye. Um, the really dangerous immune mediated sign though, the one that um, tends to reduce dog life expectancy that are infected um, and sometimes cats as well, is glomerulonephritis. So it's very, very important um, to monitor protein loss and kidney function 
um, in infected cats and dogs. Um, and you can also get neurological signs um, from central nervous system and spinal uh, granulomas um, through immune complex uh, accumulation. Diagnosis, or certainly a definitive diagnosis, can be tricky. It's a tricky parasite to pin down. Often you'll need to do more than one thing. Um, although clinically affected dogs do give you a little bit more to go at. So again, just remember that that travel history might not be recent. So you know, clinical signs commonly occur months after treatment, uh, after infection, sorry, sometimes years. Um, so there may not be an obvious initial history of travel at all. You also need to bear in mind that a lot of dogs are imported for breeding and might not be tested. So the infection might have occurred one generation up. So it's also important just to check that mum and dad uh, weren't imported as well. Um, quantitative serology is you know, a very useful test. It's one that I use a lot. And um, because it gives you a benchmark, not only of whether exposure has occurred, but then whether there's possible active infection, and whether clinical signs are likely to develop. So whether you've got climbing antibody titers over time. It's also extremely useful for monitoring response um, to treatment, um, and particularly as treatment tends to be ongoing. You can just keep an eye on those um, antibody titers and see what they're doing. Um, if you've got um, clinically affected areas, then you can have a real go at those. Uh, so fine needle aspirates are very, very useful, can often be done in the conscious patient from lymph nodes, from skin or from bone marrow. Um, you stain them up, you can look for amastigotes. Um, I mean, you can do this in-house or you can send them away. If you do it in-house, what you're looking for is... Um, these single celled organisms. So down in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see this fine needle aspirate has got lots and lots of them. Uh, this is from a lymph node and they've got two distinctive stained areas inside. So they've got their stained nucleus, but also um, something called the kinetoplast uh, that drives a tail. These are flagellate protozoa, they're trypanosomes. When they're first introduced by the sample, they have a tail that's then lost when they invade cells. The little remnant, the kinetoplast, is still visible, still there. So that's what you're looking for is this classic double staining appearance. Um, fine needle aspirates tend though to have quite a low sensitivity because of the cell yield. Um, if you get multiple ones, sometimes you can pick it up. If you get the parasite, then it's definitive diagnosis. And if it's from a clinically affected area, you can be pretty confident that the leash mania is causing the clinical signs. Um, and you can also biopsy, uh, which is going to give you a much um, higher sensitivity because you're going to get a bigger piece of tissue. Um, generally, you can go for bone marrow. That's pretty invasive. Generally, multiple biopsies of skin and lymph node um, are going to give you a result either by finding the amastigotes or you can do PCR on these tissues. So either on fine needle aspirates or on the biopsies themselves. PCR though is another useful initial test in that it is pretty sensitive. Um, if you go for conjunctival swabs, it's non-invasive, um, you know, it's highly specific. You can do it off blood as well. It's still very highly specific off blood much less sensitive though. So, you know, fine to use blood for a PCR for an initial screen, but if it's negative, it's not going to tell you very much. Testing is hugely important in treatment monitoring. So, you know, you're really looking at doing a sort of thorough clinical exam, biochemistry, hematology, urinalysis, all singing, all dancing. Uh, one month after the start of treatment, and then ideally, if the owner can afford it, every three months after that. Um, you can then, you know, extend that to every six months after the first year if the patient's doing well. Um, what I do like to do, though, is also to do quantitative serology every six months, or if you suspect a clinical relapse is occurring. 
And because those antibody titers will give you a real feel um, for where the infection is going over time. It's very easy to get carried away with all these tests. You're doing lots and lots of tests, but there are some parasites that are just big that you can just pick up on the initial exam. So, you know, when I talk about gross parasite detection, they are, of course, beautiful. I am actually talking about their size. Um, it's actually quite exciting if you get one of these in your day. Lots of clients have them sneezed onto their carpet or passed or noticed. But it's always much better if you can pick that up, pick them up on that initial examination. So Diarophilaria repens and dipethylanema are big filaroid worms. They tend to be in skin nodules, um, but sometimes they can be detected uh, around the eye. Yeah, they can be released from nodules around the eye. Most commonly, we as vets come across them during surgery. So um, the one in the bottom left hand corner uh, emerged from a castrate, um, prescrotal castrate incision, which was you know, very exciting for the people involved. Um, but that's when we tend to see them because you know they're, they're living um, in the sort of subcutaneous tissue or in the skin. Um, Philasia calipeda, the eye worm, can be picked up on simple exam. Uh, they're often uh, behind the third eyelid, um, sort of down um, underneath the conjunctiva. So, you know, you do have to have a very thorough exam. Sometimes the patient needs to be sedated for them to be found. Um, and the bottom in the bottom right hand corner is lingua tula serrata. So it's about three centimetre long nasal pentastomid. Um, you really need to be scoping to find them, um, but certainly well worth scoping if you've got a dog um, with relevant nasal signs, um, sort of sneezing, sometimes occasional nose bleeding, nasal discharge or gagging. Uh, and they've come from Eastern Europe. This parasite in Eastern Europe is actually now quite common. It's important to detect these um, partially because in the case of Philasia, the eye worm at the top, um, treatment tends to be, um, treatment outcomes tend to be much better if you can catch it early, treat it early by flushing the eye out, and then using macrocyclic lactose. Um, but it is also a zoonosis. It's transmitted by fruit flies that have got an increasing range in the UK. So we don't want it to establish here either. So detecting these uh, dogs and cats early, uh, treating them appropriately will reduce the risk of zoonotic establishment as well. That's also true for Dirofilaria repens, which often doesn't cause very severe signs in, it, in its infected patients. Um, I mean, it can cause ocular skin signs, um, but it's the fact that it's also a zoonosis. None of us want a migrating worm under our skin, really. Um, and it could easily establish in the UK in our mosquito populations. So again, catching and treating infected dogs and less commonly cats is very, very important. And in the case of lingua tula serrata here in the bottom right hand corner, um, it is very unlikely to establish in the UK. Um, there have, I say that, I mean, there have been suggestions there may be very sporadic numbers in the local fox population in the UK, but it's really the zoonotic risk, the individual zoonotic risk. So eggs from this parasite are passed in the feces or in nasal secretions, and if people ingested those eggs, then there is the possibility that they'll get infected with larval worms. Um, and that's most likely to occur through facial snuggling, which, you know, plenty of our clients enjoy a bit of a facial snuggle with their pets. Um, but there is going to be a sort of standing zoonotic risk there. So again, identifying these parasites and dealing with them is very, very important. This um, is a video that was sent to me. Uh, just warning, there's a little bit of strobe-like effect at the start, and then there may be a bit of motion sickness. I promise it's worth it. So here we go. So this, again, is a castrate. This is dipethylanema, a sort of smaller cousin of dirofilaria repens. And we just see them wandering around. This dog was completely well otherwise. Uh, but again, mosquito transmitted, zoonotic, potential for UK establishment. 
So all sorts of fun stuff turning up. I do just briefly want to mention Brucella canis. Now, I am not a bacteriologist at all, um, but I am concerned, like everyone else, that it is arriving in imported dogs. And, you know, it's very, very important that we're aware of this and we discuss this with clients and charities that are importing uh, dogs from endemic countries. And these are mostly Eastern and Southern European countries. So, you know, Eastern Europe especially, uh, we're seeing um, a lot coming in at the moment from Romania, um, but also uh, from the Mediterranean. And it has to be said, any mainland European country could have a Brucella canis uh, positive dog. Um, it can cause significant signs in infected dogs, so mostly reproductive. Um, dogs can be infertile, they can abort, they can have ongoing endometritis um, in the boys, they can have epididymitis, orchitis, scrotal edema, cross your legs, it's not very nice. Um, but you can also get non-reproductive signs, so you can get ocular signs and spinal signs, um, lymphadenitis, and infected dogs sometimes just aren't doing very well. So they can be lethargic, exercise intolerant, they can be wasting. Um, so it's a wide variety of signs that we have to be aware of. I, I would say in the cases that have been reported so far, reproductive signs are the most common. So if you have dogs coming from endemic countries with these clinical signs, it is extremely important to test them. But I, I would consider screening as well. It's certainly worth discussing with clients and charities. If there are charities that you know are regularly importing dogs that are then coming into your clinic, it's just worth having that conversation about screening. It is important, though, before you screen, that clients know what they're getting into. If dogs are positive, then, well, at the very least, they're going to need to be kept separate from dogs, other dogs from the rest of their lives. They're going to be have to be neutered uh, because of the reproductive risk. Um, but I mean, current advice, certainly, you know, the, the sort of um, preference really from an infectious disease and establishment point of view would be euthanasia. So it's, it's very important that clients realise that is going to at least be suggested if the pet is positive. Uh, and it's really because of the zoonotic risk. I mean, the zoonotic risk is limited. Uh, I mean, if you get a positive case, uh, new owners shouldn't panic. Um, but there are sort of human cases where the effects um, of infection can be very, very serious. So um, you can get very severe um, joint, spinal, um, bone related signs in people from infection, particularly if they're immune compromised. So we just need to bear that in mind. In terms of which test you would use, so whether you'd use serology or PCR, I would talk to your external lab um, because different tests have different sensitivities and specificities. and you know, this is going to be huge decisions made on the basis of these results. So have a chat to your lab. I'm sure that they're going to be happy to talk to you about it. Um, but also let them know that that's what you suspect uh, the dog might have, um, because, you know, this is a fairly high grade pathogen and they can take necessary precautions. And certainly everybody who's handling these dogs, if you think it's a strong possibility that they're infected, should be wearing PPE. Um, you know, they should be, you know, sort of well gloved up, well aproned, you know, good hygiene, um, facial screening, um, you know, just, just because of that ongoing risk of zoonotic infection. We're often asked about screening tests. I'm often asked at SGAP as a whole of what's the magic formula for screening. Well, screening is extremely important for the reasons that I've described. You shouldn't just be testing dogs and cats with relevant clinical signs, but any um, sort of major parasites that are endemic in the country of origin. So leishmania, as we've described, quantitative serology and conjunctival swab PCR 
are very useful in, in combination. In heartworm cases, antigen blood test in combination with knots is my preferred combination. The two together are going to be pretty sensitive, highly specific, and your knots test is going to pick up other filarial worms as well, potentially. Um, Alicia canis nanoplasma, you can use serology or PCR. Both of them are going to be highly sensitive, highly specific. Um, you know, if the pets have been in the country for any length of time, serology is likely to be representative of current infection. Uh, for hepatozoan, I would go for PCR, highly sensitive and specific, but always worth doing that blood smear as well. Um, for Babesia, you know, for screening, I mean, for clinical cases, blood smear is great, but for screening, PCR is the way to go. Highly sensitive, highly specific, allows a degree of speciation. And again, for Brucella canis, and absolutely have a chat with your external lab, get a protocol together um, based on the sort of tests that they have available and that they'd recommend. Don't forget, very briefly, to check and treat the ticks, um, because ticks can be carrying a lot of these pathogens as well. So, you know, it's important to check if pets have already been treated. Um, and if they haven't, you want to clobber them with a product um, that either repels and kills or rapidly kills. Um, you've got all sorts of different options now that are going to cover that. You really want an isopsisoline or a pyrethroid. Um, Fipronil is going to kill some of them, but on its own, I wouldn't rely on it alone in travels or imported pets. Um, I'd use something with a bit more welly. Um, but nothing is 100% effective. So pets arriving in the country, even if they've been treated, should be checked thoroughly for ticks. And if you've got the not entirely cooperative patient, and I find cats especially will only tolerate this for so long, uh, there's been great tick surveillance scheme data that was published in the vet record um, that has shown where these ticks are commonly found. So, you know, it's good to focus in around the head, uh, the neck area, and then if, you, if your patient is still with you and you've got all your appendages, you can move on to the legs, sort of, you know, ventrum kind of area. And don't forget to identify them. That is hugely important because it's going to inform, you know, which sort of um, tick-borne pathogens the pet might have been exposed to. But also, um, Rhyphocephalus is going to potentially set up shock on your house. So it's very important to know whether Rhyphocephalus is there as well. Um, the tick surveillance scheme is government run, it's free at the point of delivery, and it's full of enthusiastic people who will identify your tick for you. So, you know, it's a completely free service and, you know, those results will contribute to real-time data as well. So, you know, absolutely uh, worth doing. Um, if you go to that web address, all the details uh, are there. Um, they're on the government website. Um, and it, it's, it's just a wonderful scheme. I, I'd encourage you to support it. I'd also encourage you to have a go yourself, though. Uh, the University of Bristol has a tick identification site, and it's just sort of key that you follow, just like if you're identifying a plant or, or an insect, um, funded by SGAP UK and Ireland, a little plug there. Uh, but it is, it's a wonderful resource, and you can have the deep satisfaction of having identified your own tick. But do just bear in mind um, that if you do get rhyphocephalus ticks identified on cats or dogs, um, they can establish in houses. And having established, they can transmit those pathogens that I've described, including Mediterranean spotted fever and other rickettsia, which are zoonotic. So it's very important to know if you've got an infestation and deal with it as quickly as possible. Um, Rhyphocephalus can complete its life cycle very quickly, but the big difference between it and, say, Dermacenta or Ixodes is that the larvae and the nymphs 
uh, are going to feed, all the life stages are going to feed on pretty much anything that moves, uh, including people and pets in the home. And this allows it to survive in homes in a very similar way to fleas. Um, and although it's a Mediterranean, Eastern European tick, it's unlikely to establish outdoors in the UK anytime soon. Central heating means it can persist over the winter as well. And you know, once these infestations established, they can take a long time to get rid of. These are pretty tough ticks. So it is really important um, to identify infestations quickly uh, and get house treatments. Um, you know, it's a it's a sort of um, pest control job. Um, you know, you really need to get experts in and also, you know, treat all of the animals in the house as well. A lot of pet owners just aren't going to be aware uh, of all of these sort of factors and considerations when, when they're going to import their pet. And ideally, it would be good to talk to them before they take these responsibilities on. And also important to engage charities as well. I know a lot of us as vets, you know, we're, we're concerned about the fact that these pets are being imported at all, but it is going to happen. So if we can engage with owners, just sort of, you know, make them aware of a lot of the things that they need to consider, including all of this testing, potential zoonotic risks, that, that's great. And also charities as well. A lot of charities, you know, they're not going to stop importing because we tell them, you know, that it might not be a good idea. I mean, they're doing it with absolutely, you know, the best interests, the best intentions at heart. Um, and a lot of them want to do the right thing in terms of sort of testing and screening. So it's very, very important that we engage and we try and help them to do that. Um, and this is a, just a download that you can get from the SCAP UK and Ireland website just to share with owners, discuss a lot of the considerations about pet importation. So in summary, you know, testing is absolutely crucial. Uh, both, to, both to maintain UK biosecurity, um, to limit zoonotic risk uh, for clients, uh, and for the individual patient health, to help assess prognostic outcomes, treatment plans, management plans. Without testing, we're blind. Um, and it is extremely important to screen imported cases as well as test the ones that are exhibiting clinical signs. I hope I've, I've convinced everyone of that tonight. Um, but as they do try and engage with important charities, try and get them testing or try and get them um, to use you to test for them um, and try and educate owners, um, both as to whether they might want to import a pet in the first place rather than um, adopt um, locally. There's lots and lots of UK pets need homes. Um, but if they are going to import uh, a lot of the sort of precautions that they're going to need to take, it's important to discuss soon audit risks with them, but it is important to keep them in perspective. They are generally low. We, we don't want to unnecessarily frighten clients. Just make sure that we keep them as safe as possible, and that we maintain that wonderful um, human animal bond by keeping soon audit risks to a minimum. Um, and do just remember that some parasites, big chunky parasites, can be detected by clinical exam alone. So always that thorough clinical exam is always worth doing. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you for listening. I think I'm going to pass back over to Amy now and we're going to take some questions. OK, thanks very much, Ian. This is Lisa Martin again from Hariba. Um, really, really enjoyed listening to you. you, you you're so knowledgeable and so enthusiastic about this subject. It's been, been a really great talk this evening. Thank you. Um, and I think we'd all agree that we've got um, a real benefit in having Ian speaking for us, be, being a real expert on this topic, um, who's also a practicing vet. So he sees these day to day cases um, and is able to give us examples that are really relatable for, for anybody who's working in practice at the moment. Uh, we've seen some great images and examples of, of all of the um, issues that Ian's talked about. And he's also given us some of those great SCAP and other resources that practices can refer to. Um, 
these these dogs and also the cats as well they can be real trojan horses you know we we will be able to pick up more easily on the ones that are exhibiting symptoms um but the ones that are asymptomatic um you know who knows what they may be carrying and i think we've really heard the, the importance of screening testing. Um, we have had some questions come in that, that we will come on to. If there are any questions that spring to mind um, after the webinar has finished, our contact details are on the screen. If you have uh, queries for the Hariba team or for Ian as well, uh, we can pass those on to him or you, you're able to contact him directly, um, usually via the practice. Um, so questions that have come in so far, um, I've had one from Liz Abyss, which is relating to our um, ionised calcium meter. So, Liz, we have your email address from the uh, attendance list, so we'll get in touch with you separately about that. Thank you for the question. Uh, and then Bree Merritt has mentioned, um, it's more of a comment really than a query, but uh, a colleague has discussed SNAP tests for brucella with the APHA, and the advice was that there is no validated test. Sensitivity and specificity is low, so our approach is not to screen, uh, but to do serological testing on suspected cases. So this is relating to SNAP tests rather than reference labs. Um, would you have any comments about, about uh, testing on that, Ian? Oh, only that I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, testing, I mean, these are, you know, that's a huge decisions, you know, potential life-changing decisions for the pets and, and for the new owners uh, or prospective owners are going to be made on the basis of these tests. So I, I would always use a reference lab uh, for Brucella, um, you know, and, and talk to them about which are the best cases to use. So, no, absolutely. I mean, there are lots and lots of pathogens that I would use a patient side test for, uh, but, you know, Brucella is, is not one. OK, thank you. Uh, there's also been some discussion at Horeba this week as well um, in relation to PCR testing um, and as you touched on in your talk uh, about the increasing risk of brucella um, and whether testing for that may become um, mandatory for, for dogs that are coming into the UK um, through, through known, you know, through the conventional routes. Um, what might your experience of that, that actually happening be? Well, I mean, at the moment, it's open for discussion. I don't think there's any plans to introduce it, but I think that there's a very strong case um, for introducing it. Uh, and I think that, you know, many, many vets would agree that the, the zoonotic risks involved, um, but also the number of cases that we're seeing, um, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of dogs imported from endemic countries. It's just very, very important to know the status of these dogs, you know, particularly you know, if dogs may potentially then be used for breeding, um, you know, I just think, yes, it, it's much better to know. And it is tough. It is tough for prospective owners because a, a po positive result is, is going to be a big hit for them. But it's just much better to know in, in advance. So, you know, I, I would be a supporter of, of compulsory testing for it. I, I certainly think it's a discussion to have going forwards. Mm, agreed. And I think you've made some really good points as well about the, the dogs that um, are coming through either UK rescues or international rescues um, where the history may well be lost. You know, some of these dogs come with physical and quite significant emotional problems as well. Um, so they may have been uh, in more than one home before you, you've seen them. And I think your practical advice around potentially treating these dogs as carriers of, of diseases that you need to screen and protect your staff against as well is, is a very good point. So whilst we don't want to um, you know, be alarmist about them, the zoonotic risks can't be ignored for, for staff working in practices. No, that's true. Although I think that the perhaps one of the silver linings of, of sort of, you know, the past year or so is that clients are, are perhaps less um, shocked by us all turning up in a bit of, you know, protective gear. So you know, I think that that's become normalised to a certain extent. And I think, you know, just explaining to clients um, that, you know, the, the clinical signs might indicate that we've got a zoonotic pathogen, you're going to put some gear on. I think that they're going to completely understand that. Um, I mean, you know, there are endemic sort of pathogens like ringworm. I'll, I'll properly, 
properly glove and suit up for, you know, if I'm going to have a ringworm positive cat. So, you know, I think just taking those, those sensible precautions are, are, are very important. Yeah, thank you. I think that's a really good point. And um, yeah, the the the, <laughs> the commonness, if you like, of seeing people in in full PPE now is um, is less alarming. I think for people and for pets. I think the whole white coat syndrome that we used to see is perhaps reduced in, in recent times. Um, I've grown to love my face visor. I get less <laughs> anal gland juice, you know, bits of abscess in my eye now. It just bounces off. It's wonderful. It's like a windshield. Fantastic. And like you say, every silver lining, you know. Uh, <laughs> small, small ones, but, you know, yes. Yeah. Uh, another point that's come in, uh, it says we recommended PCR testing for a few tests. These are mainly send away with obvious delays in getting results. What's the view on the advantages of in-house for certain potential diseases? Well, that that is the advantage, uh, I would say, in that you know you're going to get the you're going to get the results back quicker. Um, you know, so I mean, this has really opened up. Well, I mean, as I as I you know sure you're aware, this has really opened up as an option for vets, um, sort of in-house PCR testing, where you know if you can go back a decade, it just wouldn't have been an option. Um, but you know, patient side testing or in-house testing as a whole has that advantage of sort of rapid turnaround. Um, it's just important to know in for each parasite how appropriate PCR is and the sort of relative sort of sensitivities and specificities. But I think as we've discussed this evening, especially for the, a lot of the tick-borne pathogens, um, you know, doing sort of group PCR testing for them is, is very, very useful. OK, thank you. Yeah, I, I think you've you've demonstrated very clearly that um, there's a range of tests that, that can be used um, with some of them. You know, it, it's very hands on. It might be looking down the microscope with the PCR testing. Uh, obviously, we have an interest in that. So in-house PCR might be the right way to go. Uh, but to take each case on its own merits and uh, and use the best test, the one that's most appropriate for the uh, the, the diseases that you're looking for. OK, uh, I'm just looking to see if we have any further questions. We've had some very complimentary comments, Ian, about uh, how excellent and informative your talk has been. So thank you for that. Uh, I don't have any more questions at the moment. We'll just give it another moment, if that's OK, just in case anybody else yeah, is, is talking. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, also, just to mention to anybody that, that's listening, um, if you have any ideas for future webinars that you would like Horeba to present, any topics, any burning issues, please feel free to get in touch. Um, we are um, very keen to, to uh, bring you content that's very interesting to you, that's engaging. Um, so if there's anything that you would like to, to hear about from Horeba that's relevant to our product range, then we'd be very happy to help you with that. Um, okay, there's no other questions at the moment. So if anybody does want to get in touch after the webinar, please do let us know. Uh, we will be sending everybody that's registered for the webinar um, a link to be able to watch it back or anybody who wasn't able to attend on the night uh, to be able to see it. Or if you want to send it on to your colleagues, if you found it useful, um, you can refer back to it or, or come back at another time and see it. So thank you again to Ian for speaking this evening. Uh, it's been very informative. We've learned a lot um, and our audience have also enjoyed it. Uh, we've had excellent content and delivery comments. Um, so this has been an absolute pleasure, um, our first uh, educational webinar from Hariba. So thank you to all of our delegates for joining us and for your comments. Um, and I wish everybody a pleasant evening. Thank you. Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening.